Now stop the video for 30 seconds and think, would you confess or not? Always keep in mind that you have no emotional attachment to the other prisoner. So please don't think, I would never betray my friend. That's not the point of the game. How to win at the game of life with a scientific approach. Game theory. When we find ourselves making important decisions in our daily lives, too often we let our emotions influence our choices, even when we know it's wrong. One of the biggest problems nowadays is the inability of many people to analyze a problem analytically and rationally, thus finding themselves making most of their decisions solely trusting their instinct. The problem here is that making instinct-based decisions should be our last resort and should be done in the absence of objective information that would allow us to make a rational and calculated decision. Making decisions on instinct is often a lazy way of acting on something. In fact, almost all bad decisions, the ones that end up getting us into trouble, are those that are made on an emotional rather than on an analytical basis. Today I'm going to talk about game theory, what it is and what it's for, and finally we're going to see in which fields this approach can help us make the right decisions in everyday life without letting our emotions get the better of us. Game theory has in fact a wide range of applications including psychology, warfare, politics, economics, and business. Despite the progress made in this field over time, game theory is still a young and developing science. During the video, we'll also play a couple of games. I suggest when we get to that point, pause the video and think about the solution before continuing. But what is really the meaning of game theory? Game theory is a theoretical framework for devising social situations between competing players. In some respects, game theory is the science of strategy, or at least the optimal decision-making of independent, competing actors in a strategic context. Don't think of a game simply as a game, but as a situation you face in everyday life where you interact with several people, and each of those people will have a personal gain or loss based on the decisions made by the other people. The key pioneers of game theory were the mathematician John von Neumann and the economist Oscar Morgenstern in the 1940s. The theory, written by mathematician John Nash, is considered by many to be the first significant extension of von Neumann and Morgenstern's work. The centerpiece of game theory is the game, which serves as a model of an interactive situation between rational players. I repeat, between rational players because the theory assumes precisely a certain level of rationality among those who play. The key to game theory is that one player's gain depends on the strategy implemented by the other players. The game identifies the identities, preferences, and available strategies of the players and how these strategies affect the outcome. The actions and choices of all participants in the game affect the outcome of each. Although there are many types of game theories, the best known are the game theories which we can divide into cooperative and non-cooperative games. Cooperative game theory is a game between coalitions of players rather than individuals and questions how groups form and how they distribute gains among players. Non-cooperative game theory has the sole purpose for each individual to achieve their goals. The most common non-cooperative game is the strategy game, in which only the strategies available and the outcomes that will be obtained from a combination of choices are listed. A simple example of a real-world non-cooperative game is Rock, Paper, Scissors. Now let's look at a couple of practical games we can use as examples to analyze game theory. First, let's look at an example of a non-cooperative game called The Prisoner's Dilemma. It's important to understand that the goal of this game is to make the maximum individual gain from the situation described. There are two criminals, let's call them Mark and Luke, who have just been arrested for committing a crime. With the evidence gathered by the police, the judge would already be able to sentence them both to two years in prison each. However, in order to get a confession, the police decide to interrogate them separately and offer them some options. Notice that neither prisoner has the means to communicate with the other before questioning. The police present each arrestee with three offers. Option 1. Neither confesses and each spends two years in prison. Option 2. If one of them confesses but the other does not, the one who confesses will be released immediately but his partner will be sentenced to 10 years in prison. Third option. If both confess, they'll each receive a five-year prison sentence. Now stop the video for 30 seconds and think, would you confess or not? Always keep in mind that you have no emotional attachment to the other prisoner. So please don't think, I would never betray my friend. That's not the point of the game. In theory, if this were a cooperative game, neither should confess. 
Combined, they would spend four years in prison, two years each. However, since as previously said, there's no emotional bond between the two of them, in theory, if one of them knew that the other doesn't confess, then he should automatically confess to be freed immediately. Furthermore, if things go wrong and his partner also confesses, he would end up being sentenced to five years instead of ten, which isn't as bad. So what is the right choice? Yep, you got it right. The correct choice is to confess, hoping that the other person will not confess. But if they both confess, then the result will be that they will each be sentenced to five years in prison, and this is the final solution of this example of game theory. If they both play optimally, then they both end up in prison for five years. But why? According to what is known as the Nash Equilibrium, both players in this situation will end up making the best move for them individually, but the worst move for them collectively. A player has found the optimal strategy, the dominant strategy, when he makes the best choice for himself regardless of what his opponent does. Remember, here we're always talking about opponents acting rationally. If Mark confesses, he should be released immediately, or at worst, in case Luke confesses too, receive a five-year prison sentence. If he chooses not to confess in the best case scenario, he would be sentenced to two years, but in the worst case, to 10 years, which is much worse. The best choice here is always to confess. And here we could talk endlessly about how many people judge their choices based purely on results. Sometimes in life, you can make the right choice and get worse results than if you'd made a bad choice. But the results can sometimes be influenced by various random factors over which we have no control or by irrational behavior, in this case of our opponent, that is difficult to predict. Our goal in everyday life is to make the choice that in the long run, on a large sample of occurrences, brings us the best results regardless of how external agents act. So what does the prisoner's dilemma teach us? The prisoner's dilemma shows that simple cooperation is not always in the best interest. As an example, when purchasing an expensive item such as a car, bargaining is the preferred course of action from a consumer perspective. Otherwise, the car dealership might adopt a policy of rigid price negotiation, maximizing its profits but resulting in consumers overpaying for their vehicles and at the risk of losing potential customers in the long run. Understanding the relative merits of cooperation rather than pure individual gain can help you next time you find yourself bargaining for something. Limits of Game Theory The biggest problem with game theory is that, like most other economic models, it's based on the assumption that people are rational actors who are selfish and maximize utility. The reality, though, is that this is not always true. Sometimes, yes, we are selfish but we're also social beings who cooperate and care about the welfare of others, often at our own expense. Game theory cannot explain the fact that in some situations, we may fall into a Nash equilibrium, and other times we may not, depending on the social context and who the players are. Let's now see how game theory changes in cooperative games. In these games, the goal is the welfare of the group, not the individual. While in competitive games we use the Nash equilibrium, in cooperative games there's what we call the Shapely value, which is a concept used to assign a reward to each player in a coalition, depending on the marginal contribution that he or she makes to it. Some points of this value. Number one, each player's contribution is determined by what they would gain or lose if they were removed from the game. This is also called the contribution margin. For example, let's say you sell ice creams in a cafe and you sell 100 ice creams a day. If one day you're sick and the ice cream shop sells 100 less ice creams because of it, your contribution margin is 100 ice creams. Number 2. Interchangeable players have the same value. What this means is that if two people bring the same contribution to the coalition, e.g. they both produce 100 ice creams in a day, they should be rewarded the same. Number 3. Players who contribute nothing to the group should receive nothing in return. If, for example, in the ice cream shop, three people work hard and sell 100 ice creams each, and the fourth spends all day on his smartphone instead of working, he should not receive any kind of compensation. There are exceptions, though. If, for example, one of the members of the group has had an accident and is injured, this member will not be able to work, and therefore the other members of the coalition may decide to pay him something anyway. Number 4. The work should be composed in such a way that all coalition members work and produce for the group equally over a relatively long period of time. Now let's see how the Shapley's value formula works. Let's suppose that Mark and Luke, owners of the ice cream shop we've just talked about, sell respectively 50 and 100 ice creams each in a working day. On each ice cream they have a profit of 
Working together, however, they managed to improve the ice cream selling process and combined in one day they sell 200 ice creams. Now, if they had not worked together, they would have sold only 150 ice creams in total, 50 Mark and 100 Luke. But working together, they managed to sell 200 ice creams and today have made a profit of $200. How are these earnings distributed considering that Luke has been much more productive than Mark? If Mark alone would have sold 50 ice creams per hour, and if we subtract these 50 ice creams from the total of 200 ice creams sold, Luke would be given credit for 150 ice creams. Maybe a bit too much. If Luke alone would have sold 100 ice creams per hour, and we subtract these 100 ice creams from the total of 200 ice creams sold, Marco would be given credit for 100 ice creams. Maybe here it seems a bit too much as well. But then how do we calculate with the Shapely formula what's right? First, we make the sum of the two values that would have been sold separately, 50 plus 100, and divide it by 2. The result is 75. This is what Mark should receive, while Luke, the more productive of the two, would receive the remainder, that is 200 minus 75, which equals 125 euro. This is an interesting result because at first glance, probably most of us would have split the profit proportionally, one-third of the total to Mark and two-thirds of the total to Luke, since this is what was sold separately. This is clearly a very simple example of how this approach can be used in a game or in a cooperative situation, but clearly the same can be done in much more complex situations. So what can we really learn from game theory and how can we use this knowledge in everyday life? Well, in a competitive situation, game theory teaches us how to approach the situation in an intelligent and rational way, while in a cooperative situation, game theory teaches us how to be fair to the group that is part of your coalition. There are countless situations in every single day of our lives in which we find ourselves making decisions and very often we end up making the wrong decision. Only by improving our analytical skills and our ability to consider the different aspects of a problem without trivially simplifying it will we be able to consistently make decisions that will be better in the long run. If you liked the video and don't want to miss the next videos, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to activate the notification bell if you haven't done so already. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.